Good morning again, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's training on health and recovery plans. My name is Tess Summer and I'm the program manager for the Health and Housing Consortium. Uh, the consortium is a collaborative network of healthcare, housing, homeless and social service organizations and government partners with the shared goal of improving health equity and housing stability. We work together by fostering cross-sector relationships, informing policy, building the capacity of frontline workers and bridging the gaps between the health and housing sectors. Um, as part of this, we often host trainings for our frontline staff across the various sectors about the state of housing, health services, legal options for clients and more. Um, a few housekeeping items. Everyone is um, already set to mute. Um, so please refrain from unmuting during the presentation. Um, we do have live transcriptions available. To enable or disable them, click the closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions throughout the training, um, please enter them in the chat box and we'll get to them throughout the, um, during the Q&A portions that we have throughout the, the event. Um, and we also welcome you to enter any resources that you know of um, as they come up throughout the event. Um, you should have received the slides by email earlier this morning. Um, I'll send them again after this training along with a recording of the session. Um, and sorry, just letting people into the training. Um, and our training today is led by Frankie Herman and Latifa Torrens from the Urban Justice Center. Frankie is a Medicaid coordinating attorney and Latifa is a certified peer specialist and healthcare advocate. Uh, we are so grateful to both of them for sharing this important information about Medicaid, HARP, and the Access to Recovery Coalition. Uh, and I will hand it off to the both of you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you uh, so much for being here. Uh, my name is Frankie Herman. My pronouns are they and them. I'm an attorney with the Urban Justice Center Mental Health Project. Um, today, we are going to be covering Medicaid 101, Medicaid HARP 101. Um, and if that term is not familiar to you, don't worry, we'll, we'll get into it. And the Access to Recovery Coalition, or as we call ourselves, A2R. So the goals of the training today are to understand the basics of Medicaid and Medicaid HARP, understand what supports and services might be available to you or community members uh, with whom you work, and to understand you know, who to go to if you have a question, if you need an advocate uh, for your situation, or if you just want to connect with others to make Medicaid easier to access for everyone. We'll be going through quite a bit of information. Some of it may stick today. Um, if you're like me, most of it won't, but um, as Tess had mentioned, we are sharing the slides and so and the recordings. So you can always go back um, or reach out to us if you have further questions afterwards. So the Urban Justice Center Mental Health Project is a legal social services and organizing nonprofit. Uh, we advocate for low-income New Yorkers who live with serious mental health concerns. And we do so from a standpoint that low-income people with mental health concerns are entitled to live stable and full lives free from discrimination. I have some information on the uh, screen here if you wanna kind of dig around our website and find out more info. Um, your trainers today are Latifa Torrance. Um, Latifa is a certified peer specialist and uh, health advocate. And myself, Frankie Herman, Medicaid coordinating attorney. You can reach out to either of us directly after the presentation at our contact information here. So Medicaid 101. Um, so what is Medicaid? Medicaid is a public health insurance program. It's funded by the federal government and then the state um, adds its own money and local counties do as well. The federal government oversees uh, the program and sets all the rules, um, but then states administer uh, the program ourselves. And so what that means is it's unique to each state. So the federal government will set some basics that any state that's receiving Medicaid has to follow, but then states can add additional money and additional programs. Yeah. Some of you might be wondering, you know, what about Medicare? So Medicaid and Medicare are not the same. Uh, some people have both, that's called yeah. dual eligibility. Yeah. And uh, with Medicaid, the, some of the differences are that um, it is funded through federal, state, and local versus Medicare is federal money only. And the program is the same throughout the nation versus Medicaid is state specific. And there's some differences in how people uh, become eligible for either of the programs. 
And um, so we're not focusing on Medicare today, but I just kind of wanted to put that up as a quick reference for some of the differences between the two. Or sorry, we're not focused on Medicare today. So who in New York is eligible for Medicaid? Um, an individual must meet all of the following criteria. You must be a New York State resident, you must have adequate immigration status, and you must meet income and resource limits. Income limits are something like from a paid job that would be uh, money coming into you um, through a W-2 or something like that. Resource limits uh, or assets uh, are things like uh, money you might have in the bank already. Um, so those are different, the immigration status limits and resource limits depend on the different types of Medicaid and we'll talk about that a little bit. So let's say you want to apply for Medicaid in New York. There are two different rules for different populations. Um, there's a set of rules you might have heard of the marketplace or New York State of Health, those are the same thing, um, or something called MAGI Medicaid, which is median era, era medium adjusted gross income. That is for individuals who have low or no income, who are under 65 years old, and in the, in the language of Medicaid, how they frame it is not disabled or blind. In order to apply under those rules, you can call the New York State of Health, that phone number is on your screen, or you can apply online and that link is also on your screen. However, if you don't qualify for that first type, you would be applying instead through um, your local district social services in New York City, it's um, the Human um, Resources Administration or HRA, that is referred to as non-MAGI. And so that's for folks who do not qualify for the MAGI, uh, folks who are over 65 years old, or who folks, folks who are quote unquote disabled and or blind. Um, the application for that is county specific. So you can look up your county office um, in the place where you live at the link on your screen. So just this is second screen here is all that again in writing um, rather than in a more of a visual format. So again, the first um, set of folks are people who would apply through what's called the marketplace or New York State of Health. Generally speaking, this is for folks who are low or no income, who are under 65 years old and are not legally disabled or blind uses modified adjusted gross income rules. It's just a different set of uh, resource and income um, standards. And you can call the number here or go online. And if you do not fit into the MAGI rules, then you would apply through your local county. Um, in New York City, meaning all five boroughs, that would be through the Human Resources Administration, outstate, so not in any of the five New York City boroughs, you'd apply through your local district social services office. And again, that's for folks who don't qualify for MAGI, and who are either legally disabled, over 65, or blind. Um, the, the rules are a little bit different and you can look up your county online. Now, let's say you heard all that and you're saying, uh, what? <laughs> um, you can call this phone number here, the Medicaid helpline, and they can assist you with figuring out how to apply. That number is 1-800-541-2831, and you can also find that online at the link that's in your slides. So uh, once you've applied, you will either be entered into, if you are uh, eligible, you will be entering into either the Medicaid managed care system or the Medicaid fee for service system. Um, most people will be in Medicaid managed care. That's the state is trying to move basically everyone into that system. There are some people who fall into categories where they are exempt from that uh, or excluded. So the difference between the two is in both, you've got the federal government providing some funds and then the state government adds their own funds. Um, and then managed Medicaid, uh, managed care Medicaid, you have managed care plans. So what are those? It's like Affinity, Health Plus, uh, sorry, Metro Plus, Health First, et cetera, the different insurance companies. Um, in the language of the state, they call it a managed care plan. Um, they're an intermediary that acts as the administrator and they provide the money to the medical providers to provide you your medical services. In fee-for-service, there is no intermediary. It's the state directly who would be authorizing uh, medical services and administering um, the, the program. So whether or not you have, whichever one you're in, if you're in Medicaid managed care or in fee-for-service, all of the following 
authorized medically necessary services are included. Um, and I'll get into what authorized and medically necessary mean on the next slide. But um, if it's authorized and medically necessary, anybody with Medicaid in New York has um, access to hospital treatment, prescription medications, outpatient treatment and preventative care, transportation to outpatient medical appointments, mental health care, including substance use disorder treatment, crisis respite, which is a voluntary short-term residential treatment program. Um, that's a little bit newer that used to be excluded from uh, all of Medicaid and now it is included. Uh, durable medical equipment, for example, a wheelchair, a Hoya lift, long-term support such as home health aids, personal care aids and nursing home care, some amount of dental and vision care, physical therapy and diagnostic tests. So what do these terms authorized and medically necessary services mean? Authorized just means that either the managed care plan or the state has approved. So they have said, yes, you can go ahead and we will cover this. Uh, medically necessary is kind of this long definition this is usually where people have trouble. A lot of the insurance plans um, have sort of a um, policy of saying something is not medically necessary, or at least it seems that way. That's usually where people have to argue and say, no, my condition should be covered. Um, you'll get a letter in the mail that says, oh, this is not medically necessary. But how they define it is healthcare and services that are necessary to prevent, diagnose, manage, or treat conditions in the person that cause acute suffering, endangered life, result in illness or infirmity, interfere with such person's capacity for normal activity or threaten some significant handicap. So a tip is um, if you get paperwork about a service that you're trying to receive, always save that in one folder so you have everything kind of in one spot. And if you receive something that states um, a denial, a reduction or an elimination of any service, um, we highly recommend calling an advocate immediately. There are some uh, time sensitive deadlines that um, that an, an advocate can assist with, you know, kind of guiding a, a person through the next steps. And Latifa will talk a little bit about those later in the presentation. So let's say you've applied, you've, you've, um, and so I'm going to focus mostly on managed care because that's mo what most people have. Uh, but if you have questions about fee for service, something comes up, you can always contact our office. <clears throat> so once you have applied and you are enrolled into a managed care plan, you'll get two separate cards. The first card is your New York State benefit card. Circled in red here is your medical ID or your SIN or your CIN. Um, that number is if you ever have a question about Medicaid, whether you're calling your managed care plan or whomever, that Medicaid ID number is the, the most important number to have. It's always going to be two letters, five numbers and one letter, which is uh, will help you identify it. Now the managed care plan card examples I have here are specific to whatever managed care plan you're enrolled in. Maybe it's Empire, Metro Plus, United Healthcare, whomever it is. Um, sometimes the plans themselves will give you a member ID number that's different than your Medicaid ID. But you don't have to know your uh, plan ID so much as your Medicaid ID because you'll still be able to get the information you need so long as you have that Medicaid ID number. The plans can look up your information with that number. So you've got your card, you're um, enrolled, and you need to find a primary care provider or a specialist. You can call the member services number on the back of your managed care card. So that, I'm gonna go back to the other screen. That's the one that has the name of your plan on it, whether it's Emblem or whoever. They'll have a member services number on the back of that card. You can ask the representative to help. So uh, find you either a primary care provider or a specialist. So a tip about that is, the representatives who answer that line aren't going to know anything about the quality of the doctors um, and sometimes their information about who is a specialist is wrong. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. You, you'll always want to call, once you have that number, you want to call ahead and, and make sure that, that the specialist you're trying to see actually specializes in the thing that the managed care plan thinks they specialize in. Um, and the other tip is that you can ask for somebody in an area convenient for you. You know, this can be close to where you live, work, socialize, whatever is easier for you to get to. And they'll just look that up by an address or a zip code. Um, and they will give you, I think, usually just about three uh, people at three, um, contact information for three providers at once. So you might 
have to go through a couple of rounds of, okay, they gave me these three providers. I called those three providers. They don't have any um, openings in their schedule for too long and I need somebody else. So you might have to go through that process a few times. Um, I would always recommend also, if there's somebody you already know that you want to see, um, let's say you've looked up, you know, a specialist that meets your needs and you want to see them, you can always call their office and ask their administrative staff or their billing department to check and see if they take your insurance. But doctor themselves often don't know what kind of insurance they accept. So you'll, the, it's more helpful, I have found, to speak to either the billing department or administrative staff. They can look that up for you. And then if you need to see a specialist in most cases, you're gonna need to see your primary care provider first, and then they offer the referral if they deem that the specialist is medically necessary. Um, if you know, you can always go see whomever, but Medicaid's not going to pay for it unless you get, you know, the referral and the authorization. Um, if you're not sure if you need a referral or not, you can always call the member services number on the back of that managed care card. Ask the representative if you need a referral for that type of specialist. Um, that's almost always going to be yes, but some examples where you do not need a referral are once every 12 months you can get a mental health assessment a chemical dependence assessment for inpatient detoxification, inpatient rehabilitation, or outpatient detoxification. Once every 24 months without a referral, you can go see, you can get an eye exam and that will include a pair of eyeglasses. If you need OBGYN services, you want to see a midwife or you need a breast or pelvic exam, that's also available without referral. And of course with emergencies, so for example, you know, broken bones, convulsions, bad burns, or if you feel you might hurt yourself or others. So I am going to pause here uh, before we go on to our next session and see if there are some uh, questions that folks have. Oh, sorry, I, we, of course, here's our contact information if you um, want free confidential information or legal assistance. Thanks, Frankie. Um, Continue to put questions in the chat. We have a couple. Um, for those who are non-MAGI, can you apply online for those living in NYC? That is a great question to which I do not know the answer. Um, I could look it up though if folks want to give, reach out to me after, after the presentation. I don't assist with a lot of applications. My assistance usually comes in after somebody has Medicaid and is struggling to get their needs met. Are there any organizations that can help apply, can, that can help apply for those that qualify for MAGI um, and people who also have SNAP benefits? Yeah, so those are separate application processes. Um, we at MHP would be able to assist with applications for uh, any type of Medicaid, um, uh, depending on the geographical zone. So we have like a few funding restrictions, but in, in New York City, certainly, um, as far as SNAP benefits, I think Essen, the Safety Net Project do applications, Latifa? I believe they do. Safety Net did was the first thing that came to mind for me. Um, they have a really great uh, complex chart of all of the different steps at HRA to um, get various benefits. So that's the Urban Justice Center Safety Net Project. Um, you can find them by going to urbanjustice.org and you'd be able to locate them there or you can reach out to one of us after the presentation and we can provide you their information. If they, if they don't do the actual applications, they would definitely know what resources might be out there because I'm sure they get that question a lot. Uh, and how often is the recertification of Medicaid? Normally it's every 12 months, but during the public health emergency that, so it's a federally declared public health emergency that has uh, prevented any states from reducing Medicaid services during the public health emergency. So right now, if you needed to recertify anytime before the end of March of this year, you would have automatically been recertified, even if you no longer qualified for those benefits. Um, any other questions, please put them in the chat. Otherwise, I think we'll move on to our next section. 
Can everyone hear okay? I see one comment in the chat about not being able to hear correctly. Okay. I think it might just be one person. All right. Okay, I'm glad that would make me sad if no one heard what I just said. <laughs> I think we're good to go. Um, back to you. Okay, so Medicaid health and recovery plans. I will pass on to my colleague Latifa. And Latifa, just let me know next slide whenever you want me to move on. Thanks so much, Frankie. Um, yes, hello. Um, once again, my name is Latifa Torrance. I am a healthcare advocate and a peer specialist with uh, the Mental Health Project at Urban Justice Center. And we will be going over Medicaid health and recovery plans, also known as HARP. I'm ready for the next slide, Frankie. Okay, what is a HARP? Um, a HARP is a Medicaid, Medicaid managed care plans. HARP is part of New York's Medicaid redesign. Um, the redesign is aimed at integrating behavioral and physical health. Um, what does that mean in plain language? That means that before HARP was um, instituted, uh, Everything, all medical, mental health, uh, behavioral health, actually, I'm going to use a mix of what we would say the language that the state uses versus our preferred language as peers. Um, so if you have any questions about language that I've used, please put it into the chat. Um, so previously, uh, mental health supports and um, substance use supports were centered around institutions. Um, they were out of the community. Um, people went elsewhere to get care. They were taken out of their places of support. The idea behind HARP is to return people to getting their care in the community. Um, so therefore, you're, instead of an institution deciding for a person what their care should be, the idea is that the person decides what their individual goals are. Also, these supports are in the community. Instead of going elsewhere, out of your community, getting on a subway or an accessor ride to an institution away, you will be able to get supports in your neighborhood or hopefully at least close by. And also that it would be holistic care. Um, instead of having um, one person handling your meds and another person uh, handling your goals. Um, the idea is to have one, at least one care manager, one person looking over the entire scope of your needs um, to make sure that all of the pieces fit together. Okay, Frankie, next slide, please. Frankie? Oh, am I frozen? Is Frankie frozen? Who's frozen? Oh, oh, did we lose Frankie? Okay, hold on. Looks um, like. Yeah, actually, if you can make me the co-host, I can um, Sorry share about that. my. I don't know what happened. You froze. Um, do you, you want to? I can host now. Whichever you prefer. Frankie, do you think I should do this, the slides? Yeah, why don't we have you do them in case my internet freezes yeah. up again okay. so it doesn't not interrupt for other folks. Apologies, yeah. everybody. Okay. I'll do that. In the meantime, Welcome. if anyone has any questions. Okay. Where we're, okay, let me just get to where we were. Okay. And let me open this. And, oh, I'm sorry, you guys can all hear me talking to myself while I work. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> we all do it. Okay, well, you can, okay, let me put it back on the presentation oh, mode. Can see it. Hello? Okay, there we go. Um, one and, moment, if you are not presenting, would you please mute yourself? Um, thank you so much. Of course I was. Okay, here we go. Okay, I am back. Um, so we were talking about what is a health and recovery plan, and I'll go on to the next slide. Um, so in more detail, um, what is a health and recovery plan? HARP is for people with complex behavioral needs. Um, these are mental health conditions and substance use disorders. Um, now, as I will present later, um, I am here as a member of ICANN. 
um, which is the Independent Consumer Advocacy Network. Um, I will explain that later. Um, but what that means is that I can say anything I want, but I can only show you certain slides. So what I'm going to say right here is when we say harvest for people with complex behavioral needs, um, the idea is, is that when people really need uh, supports, um, that HARP is there for them. The reality is that HARP is a cost-saving program for the state. Um, someone qualifies for HARP um, based on usage. If they have a certain number of inpatient stays, a certain number of detox visits, a certain number of emergency room visits. Um, in a best case scenario, HARP provides supports to um, help people uh, to get to the recovery that they are looking for, but HARP is often advertised as this great thing that most people can access, and it's not true. Um, the state places people in HARP programs um, to save money. Uh, once again, back to the slides, HARP services are free. Um, you can keep all of the benefits of your regular Medicaid managed care plan, and HARP adds the benefit of care management and behavioral health, home, and community-based services. What does that mean? We will do that on the next slides. So once again, uh, what is a health and recovery, uh, back to the, the health and recovery plan. A lot of people want to know, can I keep my current providers? Most likely. Um, but we advise everyone to always call and check before they change because unfortunately, um, the contracts and providers and different uh, care organizations are constantly changing on the managed care plans. HARP, however, I can say with, a, you know, with no caveats that HARP plans will not affect other current benefits, will not affect SSI, SSD, or SNAP food stamps. Um, for those of you who uh, do not speak um, in mumbo jumbo, SSI is supplemental security income, SSD is social security disability insurance, and SNAP are supplemental nutritional assistance programs, more commonly known as food stamps or um, in New York City EBT. Who qualifies for HARPs? Cannot receive a HARP if someone is Medicaid only, kind of can't receive HARP if you're duly eligible. Um, that is changing, um, and I believe Frankie addresses that in um, some later slides. Um, previously, uh, once someone became eligible for um, Medicaid, they would lose their um, HARP benefits, um, but in the past year, the state has slowly been incorporating um, more managed care organizations into the HARP for people who have dual eligibility so that they can maintain their supports um, and um, helpfully maintain their recovery. Um, you cannot qualify for a HARP if you live in a nursing home, if you are already in a different special plan, or if you receive services from the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities, also known as OPWDD who qualifies for HARP. Um, currently, only people enrolled are in Medicaid managed care, um, must be 21 years of age or older. Uh, sometimes people call um, and they are under 21 and um, they are still under the um, youth services, but once someone becomes 21, um, they may qualify for a HARP. And also, it must the person must be identified by New York Medicaid as someone with serious mental health conditions or substance use disorder. That's the part where I talked about previously where you cannot enroll in a HARP. Um, there is a computer and an algorithm and New York State goes through and pulls people out based on usage. Um, and then we'll send letters most of the time um, to let people know that they qualify for a HARP. Um, there is no application process, um, as I said, the state sends out letters, and many people are eligible but don't know. Um, that's one of the things that we try to do the most is to get people to give us a call, which we will give the numbers later, um, to try and find out, are you enrolled in a HARP? What services could you possibly um, be eligible for and don't know? Okay, Frankie, um, I believe this part is yours. Just 
getting my video started here. Okay, hopefully this doesn't freeze again. Okay, so there are two ways to find out uh, if you are eligible for Medicaid HARP. Um, if you want to just uh, make a call yourself, you can contact New York Medicaid Choice at 855-789-4277. You're gonna wanna have uh, your Medicaid ID number, that's that two letters, five numbers, one letter, uh, you know, Medicaid ID number we talked about earlier, or your social security number ready. So when you call, you'll get uh, an automated system. You will put in your Medicaid ID or social security, your date of birth, and then um, that will put you forward to a human who will ask you the exact same questions again. Um, what you wanna do when you speak to the representative is ask if you are HARP eligible or um, more specifically, you can say, what is my H code? Um, if they say you're not eligible or you don't have an H code, then that's then you're not eligible. Then you can't enroll in a heart plan. Um, if you find out that you are eligible, then you have to enroll. So the difference between the two is eligibility is can you qualify for this program at all versus enrollment is, oh, I qualify and I've decided to engage with the program and enroll. Caveat being that the state often automatically enrolls people um, into um, these heart plans. So you can keep your kind of same managed care plan, but you'd be in a different uh, version of that plan. So you would have, let's say for example, you're with Metro Plus and you're in a regular, like what's called mainstream managed care, just the, the regular managed care. And then they tell you, oh, you're HARP eligible. You can then switch from mainstream managed care in Metro Plus to the HARP plan in Metro Plus. Uh, to make things extra confusing, all of these plans call their heart plan something that I don't know past like their the the public wants to hear this like their their advertising planning. So it might be like the the wellness for all plan or whatever, but that's actually just the heart plan. Um, if you are assisting somebody who wants to find out if they are heart eligible, you can also call New York Medicaid Choice um, with them on the line. So as long as that person is on the phone and can give their consent, uh, they should be able to uh, make that phone call with you. Or we can do that with you as well. So you can contact us at 646-459-3076 um, and we can assist you with finding out if you're eligible. We don't have any uh, magic way to do this that you don't also have. So we would just make that phone call with you um, but whether or not you're eligible, we can then answer your questions and help with whatever kind of like next steps or um, help you understand what your, what your type of Medicaid is that your Medicaid will cover. Um, and just a note as well, some people in HIV special need plans, also known as HIV SNPs, are also eligible for heart benefits and we can help assist uh, with figuring that out as well. Okay, um, next slide. So what additional supports does HARP offer? So everyone in HARP has a right to a care coordinator or recovery coordinator. Um, that is a person who explains what supports are available. I know that there's probably some care coordinators or recovery coordinators in the room with us today and helps with going through the required steps to get those supports set up. Um, the kind of main difference between a care coordinator and recovery coordinator is whether or not you have to enroll into a health home um, a health home is uh, also confusingly named to my mind. Um, it's not a place that one lives. It is a center or an agency that would assist members with getting the care and services that, that they desire. In order to get connected with a coordinator, you can call your plans uh, member services department on the back of your plan card and ask to be connected with a heart care coordinator or recovery coordinator. I will um, give the caveat that often the member services departments have no idea what that is. Um, there's frequently poor training going on, um, so that can be a challenging call that might, a person might benefit from assistance with that call. You can also contact a health home in your county. Um, there's a link here that if you click on it, it, you can look up your county and find the health homes in your county and then ask to be connected with a heart care coordinator. Uh, unlike calling the plan, the health homes do know what a health home is and should be able to assist you with uh, that intake. Or you can call the Urban Justice Center Mental Health Project and we can help with that process as well. Uh, next slide. Okay, so, um, hang on a second. Uh, what additional supports does HARP author, uh, offer, excuse me? 
Um, there are two separate types of support groups at this time. Um, I will go through these fairly briefly. Um, and then if there are follow up questions, you know, we can try to address those and some folks in the room might be providers of these services and know a lot more about it than I do. Um, so authorized medically necessary supports called BHHCBS or behavioral health home and community based services. Um, the four groupings that are included in what's called BHHCBS are habilitation, education support services or pre vocational services transitional, intensive, or ongoing support of employment, and non-medical transportation. So sort of briefly, um, habilitation is um, developing skills that are necessary for living in your community and your definition of recovery. So for example, you know, learning to use uh, transportation services, how to manage money, managing trauma, or securing TTY services. Educational support services or pre-vocational support services, such as formal training or school that has a goal of achieving skills necessary for employment. Transitional intensive or ongoing support of employment is building uh, work skills or a work record towards the goal of achieving or maintaining employment at or above minimum wage. And non-medical transportation, which is pretty unique to uh, Medicaid HARP, which is tree, free, just, uh, excuse me, free transportation to something related to your uh, a goal in your plan of care. So for example, if you you know, need to get to a job interview or a college fair or a, a preparatory class, something like that, you can apply for non-medical transportation and um, get free transportation um, to that, that um, destination that's related to something in your, your goals. Um, next slide. The second group, which is, um, it's a new grouping and the way you access these are different than the previous group and we'll kind of get into that is called CORE. These have been in effect since February 1st, um, although in theory they were also available under BHHCBS and are supposed to be the same as they were before in terms of what actual services you receive, just a different referral process. It's new, we'll see how it works out. Um, so these are um, CORE, Community Empowerment and Recovery, these are meant to be mobile support, right? So this is available rather than you going to a clinic or an office someplace, um, it's meant to be available to whatever works for you. That can be where you live, where you work, where you learn, where you socialize, um, someplace that you feel comfortable meeting with somebody. Um, in some cases, you can get these services through telehealth and there's supposed to be no wrong do door referral. So what does that mean? <clears throat> Excuse me, it means you can refer yourself, someone who uh, else can refer you, you don't need an eligibility assessment, you don't have to join a health home, and you don't need to necessarily go to your primary care physician or care coordinator, although all of those individuals could also make the referral, it's just not required. Um, next slide. So what are core services? Um, community Empowerment and Recovery is the acronym uh, for, uh, is the, what the core acronym stands for. Um, these are empowerment services, uh, peer support, family support and training, psychosocial rehabilitation, and community psychiatric, psychiatric support and treatment. Um, we, I'm sure we have a lot of peer specialists in the room today, including Latifa, who can uh, answer your question, more detailed questions, but this is getting help from somebody who knows what you're going through, they've been through it themselves, and additionally have been through training and are certified. Family support and training is your family of choice. This does not have to be your biological family. It can be anybody who you consider family um, and they can be involved in your recovery. Uh, for example, you know, learning more about your particular mental health conditions and learning communication skills, those types of things. Psychosocial rehabilitation um, is a very broad array of services and sort of um, vaguely speaking are about helping you improve your life satisfaction and wellness as you want it and need it. And then community psychiatric support and treatment is uh, more of clinical support. So it supports provided by clinical professionals addressing barriers um, such as housing, finances, employment, family and relationships. Uh, next slide. Okay, so kind of all of that again, just in a more of a visual format. Um, there's sort of like two different groups of how to get help supports, core, has the no wrong door. There's just a simple form that the agency can set up for you. So let's say you know that you want peer support and you go to an agency that provides peer support. 
that agency themselves can just fill out the simple form and get you started in peer support as soon as their kind of like intake volume allows for it. Uh, versus BHHCBS, you need to have a care or recovery coordinator. There is an eligibility or assessment required, and there are multiple steps between kind of bouncing back and forth between the care coordinator, what they submit to the insurance plan, and then um, getting connected with a provider agency and what they have to submit to the insurance plan as well. So it's a more uh, multi-step process to getting there. Um, and you know, for the BHHCBS, you can talk to your care coordinator, they can help. Um, if you're not connected with a care coordinator, again, you can call uh, member services or a health home directly and ask to get connected with a, a care or recovery coordinator. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, and back to you. Unmute, okay. And after all of that, what? I don't understand, what is happening? That's so complicated. Well, that's where ICANN can come in. Um, so as I mentioned before, ICANN is the Independent Consumer Advocacy Network. Um, we are the Ombuds program for people with Medicaid managed care um, who need assistance, who need to help understanding. Um, as we have mentioned um, before, New York's, the federal government gives money to New York State that New York State then used to um, fund Medicaid by giving money to managed care providers. And New York State also contracts with ICANN uh, to make sure that the, Medi the Medicaid managed care providers are providing the services that they are required to provide. Um, as many people know, um, Medicaid managed care providers receive a flat rate for every person in the plan. Therefore, um, it's not in their best interest financially um, to provide services. And so often we are hitting walls where um, the managed care organizations just flat out don't provide services, are slow to provide services, create bureaucracy to provide services, um, or even honestly withhold information from people on how they can get the services that they are entitled to. Um, as an ICANN representative, I believe, and it is my job, to make sure that every person I can assist, um, that I help them getting their services that they are um, entitled to, either through law or through contract. Um, and many people possibly can't know their rights. Um, we, this is a, such a complex system that we really need uh, advocates to assist people with these systems. I'll go to the next slide. Um, so how can ICANN help you? Um, we can identify and solve problems with your plan. Um, so for example, if someone needs um, dental implants, um, that might not sound like that's not a, a HARP specific concern, um, but I do have clients who are under HARP plans um, who have uh, requested these um, things from through their dental service. And then the subcontractor for the managed care organization will say, no, that is not medically necessary. Um, and then um, we work to get a plan together um, to prove that these what people need are medically necessary. Um, I can help, I can, can help people understand their rights. Um, we help file complaints or grievances. Um, for example, if someone is not receiving uh, the proper personal care hours that they need, um, which some of you, probably many of you know that the state is in a crisis right now uh, with personal care hours. Um, personal care uh, workers um, are paid very low rates. Um, they have to travel very far. Um, plus COVID and vaccination requirements, um, it's nearly impossible for people to fulfill hours. And we are there uh, to help with the process of filing complaints, making sure that the insurance companies provide the services because a lack of workers is not an excuse for not providing services. Um, we can also help with an appeal or an action that you disagree with. And um, who do we help? As I mentioned, we help anyone who is enrolled in a Medicaid managed care plan who needs long-term care or behavioral health services. Um, we also help people who are newly eligible for enrollment at Medicaid managed care plan, and we help people choose plans and enrolls. 
enrolled. So while though I specialize in HARP, um, ICANN is a statewide organization, which I believe I'm probably jumping ahead in the slides. Yes, here we go. Um, ICANN is across the entire state. So um, people can call if they have any questions um, about Medicaid. And then if it is a HARP specific question, it will be routed to us and we will help you. Um, but I think, you know, anybody who has any questions, especially about long-term care or durable medical equipment, um, I've had people, you know, who need a step-in bath and all of those sorts of things. It's really complex. Um, the advocates who work for ICANN are incredibly dedicated um, and we meet monthly to discuss what's going on across the state. What are we seeing that's happening? Um, and how can we um, get things for people that people need? Um, and so how do we help? Well, our trained counselors answer our tele toll-free telephone hotline Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. We also have email and chat. We have um, counselors who speak English, Spanish, Russian, and Mandarin Chinese. We give educational presentations such as this one. Our services are completely free and confidential. We do not work for the managed care organization and we do not work for the state. We are independent. Um, yes, there are some things that I cannot um, show on a slide, but I can absolutely talk about everything that we see going on. We all talk to each other and we know what sorts of roadblocks people are hitting um, in getting the services that they are eligible for. Um, prior to the pandemic, we could meet people in person um, at our offices or at our, their homes. Um, and as I mentioned, we monitor our cases for potential trends. In fact, last year, we, we started telling the state that this is an emergency with personal care assistance and then um, started speaking to the, you might see in like the last budget, um, the governor in, is pushing um, bonuses to try and recruit more personal care assistance. And so what do we offer? Um, information advice. If someone just has a question, you receive a notice and you don't understand what it means. Um, for example, I had a client who received a notice that her provider had not submitted um, their bill in time to the insurance company and the person wanted to know, does that make me responsible? And I was able to answer that question and say, no, this is just a notice that they messed up, they're not gonna get paid, it's not your problem. We can also help navigating health plans. And uh, as I do, mostly what we do are help with appeals, grievances, and fair hearings. Um, that is also like very complex where if someone, if you want something and you don't get it, you can do an appeal versus you can do a fair hearing. Um, it's too complex to go into in this, in, in this um, presentation. Um, but just so you, if you hear that, if a client brings that up or if you see it yourself, you'll know like, oh, fair hearings. Okay, I can help, I can ask HARP for help with that. I mean, I can for help with that. So we can help with, what is HARP? Am I enrolled in HARP? Um, how do I get the behavioral health services? What are the behavioral health services? My behavioral health services were denied or reduced or I received mail and I don't understand it. Um, with the transition to CORE, um, I had a client who received a letter about medical trans, about non-medical transportation and she didn't understand it. So I was able to um, speak with her about the changes because there aren't a lot of people who understand because the changes just started happening in February. Um, also, if you disagree with your plan of care, we are focused on person-centered plans and not every provider is up to speed on where we are today. And so if someone puts something in your plan of care and you don't agree, you can call ICANN and we can help. So what happens if I'm not eligible for HARP? And I think that I should be. Um, the Medicaid program continually reviews um, and changes the, um, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I just got caught up in my um cycle. If you, um, okay, hold on. This is where I'm gonna use a peer technique. I'm just gonna slow down <laughs> and not get into my head about my anxiety, about my presentation skills. So we can review your needs and we have lists of what the state currently uses to assess people for HARP. So you can contact ICANN and we can go over the list with you. 
if you do not currently qualify, we can talk about what may change in the future. For example, say someone has um, in the middle of an SSD, a social security disability or social security insurance um, case, that might change your HARP eligibility. So you can always contact HARP, uh, I mean, sorry, contact ICANN um, to get any help with coordination of behavioral care services or just any questions about how to access Medicaid. Okay, so uh, once again, if someone receives a denial, if you disagree with the decision, if there's no response to a decision, uh, you may have legal actions and you may be able to file an appeal. Also, sometimes it's just a matter of calling the right people and making sure the paperwork gets to the right place. So um, I'm getting a little feedback. So if someone could mute, um, who isn't muted, that'd be great. So remember to save all your paperwork um, in the, in, in the pandemic, lots of things are coming electronically. I had a client who saved everything on a thumb drive. Um, so just make sure you have everything in one place and call ICANN as soon as possible. The number is 1-844-614-8800. So finally, call ICANN or email ICANN or go to our website. Um, and now I'm going to pass this on to Frankie. Oh, actually, we have time, we have time for questions. Thank you so much for that. Um, Latifa, that was super informative and really helpful. Um, so I have a bunch of questions, both related to um, HARP as well as um, I can. So just starting with ICANN, um, can I can help someone who is disabled and having issues with rides to hospital visits? Um, I can can definitely help. Um, it's just a matter of finding out what coverage a person has um, and figuring out um, what, you know, making sure that we get through the bureaucracy of is this a HARP issue? Is this a not a HARP issue? Um, is this your managed care organization? And what are their um, requirements as far as transit? Um, Frankie, I mean, medical, medical transportation is still covered? So. Yes, absolutely. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Non-emergency okay. medical transportation is a service as long as authorized and medically necessary available to anybody with Medicaid. Um, that said, as it sounds like the you know person probably knows, there are a whole host of issues with um, either getting things approved or you know people not showing up for three hours later after they were supposed to show up, things like that. But those are um, you know both in terms of eligibility and quality of service issues, things that we can either assist with or you know you can always call us and ask like, oh, do you help with this? If we don't, we will do our best to find you a referral to an agency that does. So, you know, the, there's different agencies that we work in collaboration with, you know, NILAG, Empire Justice Center, all these different agencies. Um, we all kind of collaborate together as much as possible to get the community's needs met. Thanks, Frankie. Um, and to clarify, is I can only for people who are a part of HARP? Or can no, I can is for anyone across the state with a Medicaid um, concern. Uh, I personally handle, um, well, me and our, our colleague Juliet handle HARP calls for the state, um, but ICANN is the Independent Consumer Advocacy Network for anyone um, with a Medicaid question. Yeah, I mean, ICANN is specifically for people with long-term care needs, but you can always reach out to ICANN uh, and ask your question. And if it's not something that ICANN covers, again, ICANN like like all, all the or, uh, legal services organizations will try to get you to somebody who can. So there's kind of no, there's a lot of phone numbers we've been throwing around in this presentation. There's not really a wrong number to call. If you call somebody and we can't help, we will find you the right person if, if there's somebody out there who does the, the thing you're looking for assistance with. Cool. But what I'm hearing is true. just give someone a call at some point in time and you'll get connected. <laughs> it's absolutely true. We're incredibly collaborative. All right, um, so I have some more um, 
related question. So um, what are the number of hospital visits that can qualify someone for heart programs? Okay, I opened a can of worms with that one, but I also feel like it's important to be um, honest. Um, off the top of my head, I do not know, um, but if someone wanted to contact me uh, to discuss a specific client case, I would happily to be over to go over the details um, for someone. Um, it's, it, it, also, it also depends on the severity. It's sort of like three, I mean, this is just not the exact number, but it's like three inpatient stays over the course of a year. Uh, it depends on if it's um, pre-criminal, uh, uh, um, I, I, we're not using criminal justice, but, but if someone has been before someone has uh, uh, been in the criminal system, uh, it's a certain number of uh, inpatient visits to detox. It's very specific for depending on someone's diagnoses um, and situation. So I don't want to give um, broad answers and give people incorrect information, um, but I am happy to um, go over individual cases with anyone who wants to contact me to talk about um, HARP eligibility. Yeah, thanks Latifa. I would also add to that that we can share, um, there's like a little chart that I made that has like the the details on it. We can share that with you, Tess, and then if you want to just sh share that with folks when you send out your materials, um, we're happy to do that. And that if you kind of go through this and um, if you go through like the checklist, and it seems like someone should be eligible, they meet everything, but they're not coming up as eligible, that's also something we can assist with. I have one, a fair hearing for somebody who was marked as ineligible incorrectly. Yeah, um, we'll definitely send that, that chart out um, in our follow-up. Um, can a client self-apply for HARP? So is that self-apply? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so no, um, we can go through, if someone believes that they are eligible for HARP and with us or on their own have called New York Medicaid Choice and find out that they don't have an H code and believe that they should, then um, as Frankie mentioned, we can go through the checklist um, and if we find that that person should qualify, we can go through the process. Of course, there's a process and papers and emails and letters to send to the state to say, Hey, this person should qualify. You know, please look into this. You know, change the codes in the computer so this person qualifies. But it's not something that someone can do by themselves. Okay. Um, yeah, there's no like online application process. It's really just the state looks at your usage of uh, medical services and makes a determination based on these formulas that they've they've created. Um, someone asked, if you learn that, um, if you learn that being part of HARP affects your relationship with providers, is it easy to leave the program yes. or are you, are you committed to it for a certain amount of time? Um, Frankie might know this off the top of their head, but I know once you are enrolled, you have, I believe it's a 90 day period initially. Um, and if you find out, if you decide that, you know, HARP is not for me, you can disenroll. Um, after that, it's a little bit more complex. Um, Frankie might um, be more clear on that. Um, I believe you have to have a, a complex reason. I'm sure there's like a list of, of reasons why one could leave HARP. Um, but I'm, I'm sort of interested in the, the source of the question as why a provider might not, it's like if it was causing conflict that someone was, um, mm -hmm. was in a HARP program, because it's really, I mean, it's just a, a name for a set of services. But then again, because we do have so much stigma in our society about mental health and substance use, um, I can imagine that. Um, my someone might be in a situation where where someone would um, there would cause some conflict, but also as Frankie mentioned, lots of times providers have no idea uh, what um, insurance you have. Um, I do know that sometimes you know some smaller um, providers who handle their own billing might know, 
Um, but also I think that someone, if someone was having that as an issue, I would actually would hope that they would give us a call um, to talk about that because I would really, it's just me personally, I would, I would hate for someone to miss out on the supports, even though I was, you know, I, I can be um, a bit cynical about how HARP is advertised. Um, the, the ideas behind it are fantastic. I mean, as a peer, um, I really value community-based supports and peer supports and the sort of things that people can access when HARP works well. So if someone is hitting a roadblock, um, then, um, you know, just personally as an advocate, um, I would want someone to give me a call and say, and you could talk about it confidentially to, you know, see what's going on. Yeah, I think people may have just been worried about, you know, how it might impact eligibility. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I love the option where that is an issue or they're, you know, getting pushback from any of their providers, they can reach out to you to hopefully um, manage that or. Yeah, in, in most cases, if you stay within the same managed care plan, meaning the same insurance company, in most cases that should not change your provider network if you switched from like a mainstream managed care, for example, with Health First, and then you switched into a heart plan with Health First, those provider networks are supposed to be the same. Now I imagine uh, because these systems are constantly throwing up administrative barriers that there may be some circumstances where that's not true. So you would always want to check if there's a provider you absolutely want to stay with before you switched over to any plan. And, and we can help, you know, help you figure out how to figure that out as well. Uh, could you explain the difference in services available from a health home versus HARP? Okay, so this, as Frankie mentioned, a health home is, a, I also agree, a completely confusing name for an organization. It is not a, an actual physical space. So um, for, uh, as we, as, as of February 1st, right, there are these breakup in services from core uh, to the um, behavioral health home services. And so um, I think maybe a shorthand, and Frankie can absolutely correct me on this, is that um, core is providing a sort of less, I would say maybe less intensive supports, for example. So, you know, your peer support, um, things that you don't need um, a medical authorization for, um, things that you can self-refer for, uh, you know, pre vocab pre, um, oh my gosh, I just like, uh, just pre-vocational. I was like, pre-vocabulary? That's not a word. Uh, pre-vocational training. And then the health home is sort of the more traditional, um, like say, like your community access um, or, you know, New York Presbyterian. These are these more, these bigger organizations where you will have to get a referral and you have to see this person and that person. You have to see that psychiatrist and that person to get this checked off to make sure that this is medically necessary. Um, to receive those, uh, like, you know, uh, if you want to see a psychiatrist, if you want sort of the, um, the separate section of, of services. Um, Frankie, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, just to um, add to that, um, a health home is an agency that employs care coordinators who help you navigate your health insurance plan. HARP is the name of the health insurance plan. The health home is an agency that helps you navigate that plan. Super helpful. So many names being thrown around. It's an extremely confusing process. It's really a whole new vocabulary. I mean, it's it's a, there's quite a learning curve for sure. I'm, I've been doing this for almost six years and I'm still learning things, so. Um, are people who have HASA benefits eligible for HARP? Is that HASA? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with the acronym. Um, yes, H-A-S-A. Frankie, do you know? I don't know off the top of my head. I mean, it has to do with um, aid support, I believe, but I, I haven't come across that directly in my work, but that's certainly something that if folks have really uh, questions that we don't know the answer to right this second, we really encourage you to reach out to us and we're happy to do the research and figure out the answer for you. Um, 
Um, Okay. Yeah, um, you are correct uh, by saying that Hasa, Hasa is client that have um, AIDS or that are dealing with HIV. And I know that sometimes they're eligible for Medicaid because of the fact that maybe they cannot work because of their condition. Uh, so I think they should be eligible for this as well. Thank you, appreciate that. Yes, thanks. We like to say in um, our meetings that everything is always a learning and sharing environment, right? Like nobody here has every answer to every question, but collectively we can, you know, all, all learn together and share with each other. Definitely. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And of course, feel free to throw any resources into the chat. Um, all right. So someone was wondering since the state that since the state decides who is eligible for HARP, should people just call? Is there like a state hotline you can call to see if one's eligible, or um, you know, should we should we call you guys? Um, absolutely. If someone wants to call on their own. I'm talking to you and getting the phone number at the same time because I don't have it memorized. Um, uh, we, someone can call New York Medicaid Choice. Um, and as um, Frankie mentioned, you will need your SIN or your social number or your social security number. I'm sorry, let me, let me go back. Your Medicaid identification number. I'm not gonna speak in alphabet soup. Your social security number, your date of birth, and you will punch it into the telephone system and then someone will come on the line and ask you the exact same questions again. Uh, and so the number there for New York Medicaid Choice um, for is 1-855-789-4277. And so you will call and say, I'd like to know if I qualify for HARP, or I would like to know if I have an H, that's the letter H code. And then they can tell you if you are if you have an H code, um, if you are currently enrolled in a HARP and don't know it, um, or if you are in, enrolled in a different managed care um, organization. And um, I would just say be patient. Um, people seem to be working from home, so connections are not always that great. Um, and wait times can be long, um, or sometimes you get right through. Um, this is the same number that we would call uh, if someone had a question. I'm happy to call with people just that, so that people know I don't have a special hotline that gets me through to avoid uh, any of the bureaucracy. We just have to do it together. Um, and if someone is enrolled in both Medicare and Medicaid, can they call ICANN? Um, yes. I mean, we if we are if it's not a long -term, long -term, excuse me long term care cons consideration if it's not in our wheelhouse we will absolutely refer you to the proper people we are a huge network um, and and I have to say honestly like everyone who I've come across who works in ICANN just really really dedicated um, to making sure that people get help even if it's not um, in our specialty but also um, Frankie I was just wondering about time um, do we want to put a limit on questions so we make sure we get to your um, A two R stuff. We are good. We still actually have four minutes before oh, okay. we go to the because the ATR stuff will be quick. So okay, I I figured I this is where, where most of the questions would be. So we built in some extra okay. time. Okay, for great. This part. I misread the schedule. Okay, more questions. I'm ready. I think we only have one more question, um, but continue to add them. Um, so this is from someone who works with individuals with substance use disorder. A uh, some uh, if someone receives a uh, suboxone. Apologies if I say that incorrectly. Uh, should they already be enrolled um, in HARP automatically? That's definitely something I would um, either have you call us or call New York Medicaid Choice. Um, that I don't believe the one um, that's not enough to, to qualify. I mean, it depends on what the person's history is before mm -hmm. they um, uh, were uh, using that support. Um, but that wouldn't be enough to qualify on its own. Okay. All right. That is all the questions I have. 
Okay. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to turn this over to Frankie. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, Latifa and I have both been doing this work for a while. Um, we, you know, encounter a lot of the same barriers over and over again in this work. It's individuals who are facing systemic barriers, right? So it's uh, when I first started doing this work, I was seeing kind of like the same issues over and over again. It was very frustrating. Like, why can't these systems just function better? Why should people have to call an advocate to get services that they're entitled to? Um, so what we did at the Urban Justice Center was apply for a grant um, through the Van Amerenjen Foundation to build a coalition of people dedicated to making Medicaid HARP function better. Um, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, and the other thing we were really seeing is a lot of the materials coming from the state, um, whether that's like, I don't know if folks are familiar with MCTAC or other, like, you know, Department of Health, like webinars and whatever, they seem to be really directed towards people and from people who were kind of uh, very deep in the sort of technical know-how of how this stuff works and weren't really producing materials either that were understandable to people who are you know, directly impacted, meaning people trying to access services or those on the ground people who really are trying to navigate these services with individuals who are directly impacted. And additionally, it was very top down, like it's sort of just the state saying, oh, we've decided on your behalf, this is what is good for you. And we're looking to kind of flip that script, right? So we want this whole system, Medicaid HARP to work better we want it to be informed by individuals who are trying to access those services directly, people who are experts in their own lives and who know, you know, this is what's not working, this is what is working, here's my thoughts on how to make that better. Um, and to also produce materials that were accessible for people and not, I mean, the, the, the language in Medicaid is, is very obtuse, like it is very, there's a lot of acronyms, whatever, but there, you know, we just thought there had to be a better way to break this stuff down than what we were seeing from the state. So um, we were fortunate to get funding uh, from, to produce, uh, sorry, to build a coalition. Um, we've been meeting, I wanna say since no November-ish of 2019. Um, so we started just before the pandemic, we met in person. Um, now we meet virtually every month. Um, we, uh, the value systems are nothing about us without us, right? So it's really um, leaning into the disability um, community's value system and we're looking to shift power, right? So it's not uh, just somebody top down talking down to people, but it's people who are experts in their own experience informing the people who are making the policy of what they need to do. Uh, next slide. So we meet the first Thursday of every month from 3.30 to 5. You can attend on Zoom uh, by video or phone. We really invite folks to come check out a meeting. Um, I would say with the caveat that we very kindly ask that people who work directly for the government, meaning Department of Health, um, DOHMH, um, OMH, please do not attend these meetings because they are not for you. Um, we also very kindly ask that if you work directly for a managed healthcare organization, so let's say you're a director of something at Metro uh, Plus, we also kindly ask you please don't attend. We're trying to create a safer space for folks who are directly impacted or individuals who work very closely with folks who are. So it's directly impacted people, peers, and providers in a very broad sense. Providers also meaning care coordinators, also meaning uh, peer support specialist, um, not necessarily medical uh, people with MDs or whatnot. Um, we have a listserv that we invite you to join. It's the best way to find out, uh, to get the direct link to our meetings. Um, and you can unsubscribe anytime. It's typically pretty low volume. Um, one of the things that we achieved recently is we started negotiating with the Office of Mental Health uh, about a year and a half ago when we heard that there is going to be this new thing called core coming down the line and we were very concerned about what does that look like is that going to make things better or worse to whom have you spoken um, to design these projects etc and what's happening with it because we're not getting information as people on the ground about whatever's happening in their negotiations with the federal government um, and so we, through our conversations, decided to develop a series of town halls in which 
we uh, um, designed the town halls ourselves and then invited OMH to come in as subject matter experts and speak on kind of what is core and uh, go into a lot more detail than what we went into today. Those were all recorded. They're up on our website um, at urbanjustice.org. So you're welcome to take a look at those if you want and um, just invite folks to come in to a meeting. And then I'll just pause and see if there's any uh, questions about the coalition or anything else that we've talked about today. I'm not seeing anything. Oh, how do you guys keep from burning out? <laughs> Any tips? Um, I think my coalition work is really helpful for me because I'm not just working on indiv the same individual issues over and over again. It's it's connected to change, um, and I'm I really like the the people that are members of the coalition, and I really like my colleagues. Um, so that that to me is helpful. Um, I'd have to agree with Frankie um, that I've definitely um, struggled. Um, and when you see this sort of roadblocks over and over, and I just I I just come home and I yell, just give people money. <laughs> um, you know, uh, so you know, um, I would highly recommend if anybody has the time to work on sort of the bigger picture issue even if you just had if you could pick one thing because for me just hitting the same roadblocks day after day after day and knowing that um you know i just have my finger you know in a dam and nothing is going to change it's just it's it's soul crushing um and whether it is um you know joining the appers or the access to recovery coalition or you know, just picking one small area where um, I can do some sort of uh, active change or speak truth to power um, keeps me from, um, you know, spending, using up all of my therapist time. And also, I think we luckily, as, as Frankie mentioned, um, we have uh, meetings among our team and I think that's one of the things that happened with the pandemic is that we're um, so many of us are working in our own homes and don't have those just moments when you can turn to someone and say, oh my gosh, can you believe what I just went through? And so we sort of built that time um, into our weekly schedule. It sort of, it didn't, we didn't plan on that, but that's sort of what it turned into and it's been incredibly helpful. Thank you for sharing that. Any other questions, thoughts? I'd actually be really curious to put that question back to attendees. Um, is there any other like thoughts or tips you have on on preventing burnout? I would just reiterate that like, your collaboration is such an excellent example that you know as much as you can reach out to other colleagues and in other places than where you work directly, you know, to sort of keep your spirits up in terms of the, the mission, you know, is always helpful. I'd also like to add as someone who's relatively new to this work, um, something that, uh, you know, Frankie has been a great mentor to me and sort of accepting that there, the needs never end. Right. So as a, as a new person, um, I've just been, I've been doing this work for just over a year. Um, I just like, I was like, how, ah, it hurts this so much. And um, I can't solve every problem. And it, that was really, really hard um, to accept. And so um, finding that space and saying, you know, I'm gonna work from this time to that time. And then after that, I'm going to, do my dance, do my yoga. And I know that for a lot of us, you know, we have other responsibilities. We have caretaking responsibilities. We have budgets and homes and um, meetings in our community. And so, uh, you know, that self-care time and that wellness time, I'm sorry, I, I will go off on this because I also do a wellness presentation, um, you know, can sometimes feel like a privilege. Um, but 
you know, um, I will say this last thing, but you know, you can't pour from an empty vessel. And I think so many of us, we go into this work because we feel, have a drive to help and um, you have to help yourself first. And um, I will get off of my podium now. Thank you for saying all that. Um, and just from the consortium sort of perspective, I kind of feel like this is a little bit why we exist because we, we really primarily work with, you know, everyone on this call. We work with people who um, either have lived experience or we work with people who are providing services for people. Um, so if you need any form of support or resources, um, definitely email us and we'll definitely do our best to sort of connect you with whatever we can do to make your job a little, a little better. <laughs> um, all right, I'm not seeing any other comments or questions in the chat. Anything, Frankie or Latifa, that you'd like to add? I just want to say thank you so much for uh, being present today. We really appreciate your interest. And uh, our team is very small. So if you reach out, we don't get back to you in five seconds. Uh, we will. <laughs> it's just, you know, like everybody here, I'm sure folks have uh, a lot on their plate. But please do reach out. Just know that it might take a day or a week. Yes, thank you so much for, for having us. Um, it's really great to um, be able to speak and hear what's happening um, with other people. And even from questions, we can tell. I mean, for me, I'll speak for myself using the I, right, as a, a peer specialist. Um, uh, hearing what people um, have questions about helps um, shape my work. Um, and then I also can go back and like say, what do I need to learn more so that I can do better next time? So thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Well, thank you to everyone for joining and thank you uh, to the both of you for, for holding space and for sharing such important information. Um, I'll be following up with the slides, with the chart that Frankie mentioned they created um, and with some of the phone numbers that were mentioned throughout the conversation. Um, and if you need me to connect you with anyone um, or have any other questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, and I'll also be sending um, some follow-up dates with our upcoming trainings. Uh, we have one um, in the first, we have two in the first week of March, one on um, uh, filling out a successful 2010 e application, um, and then another one on um, sort of a what's now, what's happening now that the eviction moratorium has ended in New York. So a lot of um, great information coming up and you're gonna get an email from me later today with all of that. Um, so thank you all and have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much.